This is the largest reserve in Canada, the Six Nations of the Grand River. Most Canadians would look at this reserve and not actually believe these are the descendants of one of the most powerful actors in our history, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Haudenosaunee were the ones most feared by the French and once ruled over the Great Lakes. This video will give you a brief overview of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, their impact on our history, and the role that they play today in Canadian politics. <laughs> I want to put a disclaimer out there before getting the video started. I'm not Haudenosaunee. I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about Haudenosaunee culture, Haudenosaunee traditions or history, but I encourage anyone that wants to share more of this knowledge and that can help us learn, just leave it in the comments or send me an email, whatever. We're all here to learn and to learn about each other and be more accepting of all of the different people that, that live in Canada. Thank you. Despite having a huge influence on Canadian history, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was initially concentrated in what is New York State today. By the time Europeans and the French in particular started establishing themselves in the area, the Confederacy contained five different Iroquois speaking groups. The Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and the Mohawks, with the Tuscarora joining in later years. The Haudenosaunee were known as the people of the longhouses. At the time, the Haudenosaunee had a population of about 12,000 people and had a more sedentary lifestyle compared to others around them. They built these massive structures that could go from 20 to 100 feet long and house 60 to 100 people. Their villages were set on hills around streams surrounded by wooden stockades that were meant for maximum protection. The men would hunt, fish, go to war, while women were more concentrated on agriculture, notably the three sisters, Maisie, Beans, Squash. Women occupied important political positions too, serving as clan mothers where they would appoint chiefs, decide if they'd go to war, and were ultimately the supreme authority for the Haudenosaunee. The arrival of Europeans drastically changed the course of history and the future of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. By the time 1609 came around, Samuel de Champlain had forged good relations with Algonquin nations like the Ojibwe, the Innu, the Mi'kmaq, and other Iroquois speaking groups even like the Huron. The only problem is that all of these nations were historical enemies of the Haudenosaunee. This all came to a head when Champlain one day decided to accompany the Huron on a raid against the Haudenosaunee and he would shoot a couple of their men. From that moment on, the French and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy would become sworn enemies for the next 100 years. Over this time period, two factors would come into play and propel the rise of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was in the Great Lakes. Number one was the fur trade. As demand for fur was rising in Europe, as was the need for more hunting grounds, indigenous nations would compete between themselves for all of these lands. Second was the arrival of more Europeans, and in the 1620s, it was the Dutch. The Dutch would become the main trading partner of the Haudenosaunee. The Dutch would provide them guns, ammunition, knives, all of these in exchange for furs. And as demand for furs kept on rising in Europe, the Haudenosaunee expanded their territory into the Great Lakes region, establishing themselves as the dominant force. All of these battles would become known as the Beaver Wars in Canada. The Beaver Wars were a series of conflicts fought primarily between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Indigenous Nations, and the French. The Haudenosaunee would launch aggressive military campaigns to expand the territory and secure a dominant position within the fur trade. During all of this, you also saw a distinct Haudenosaunee military practice called the Morning Wars. When a member of a Haudenosaunee community died, it was customary to replenish that loss by capturing members of other groups through their raids. Captives would either be adopted, replacing the deceased member, or sometimes be executed as part of the grieving process. The nations most impacted by the Beaver Wars and Morning Wars together included the Huron, the Petuns, the Neutrals, the Erie. Many of these nations were either significantly weakened, completely eliminated, or assimilated into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. By the 1650s, the Haudenosaunee had become the most feared enemies of the French, the rulers of the Great Lakes, and the most powerful confederacy in the eastern woodlands. They were more powerful than the Dutch, the French, and controlled the most vital economic activity of the region, the fur trade. The only Great Lake they weren't able to fully control was Lake Superior. When they would attempt to do so, they would be repelled back by the Ojibwe, who were themselves one of the most powerful actors in North America too. The Ojibwe are one of the few nations who resisted Haudenosaunee expansion. They have a whole other history, which is very interesting and deserve a video of its own. It'll come one day. Back to the Haudenosaunee, the six 1650s would really see the peak of their military power in North America. However, the fall of the Haudenosaunee would come as quickly and as brutally 
as their rise. By the 1660s, three factors would come into play that would significantly alter the geopolitical landscape of North America and the power of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. First was the Dutch being kicked out and taken over by the British, leaving the Haudenosaunee without as much access to guns, ammunition, and ultimately less ability to enforce their rule across their, their territory. Second, you have Louis XIV back in France who's taking his colony of New France a lot more seriously. More funding, more people, more soldiers. And finally, you have the role of diseases which took its toll on not only the Haudenosaunee Confederacy but all indigenous nations across all of the Americas really decimating their population and ultimately their leverage too. The Haudenosaunee would eventually make peace with the French and this would be known as the Great Peace of Montreal. Signed on August 4th, 1701, the treaty marked the end of the Beaver Wars between the French and the Haudenosaunee. It involved more than 40 different nations across the Great Lakes region, the Ohio Valley and the northeastern part of North America. The Great Peace of Montreal brought more stability ultimately in the continent and allowed for the expansion of New France all the way into Louisiana. Until the seven years war there was a time of relative peace for the Haudenosaunee confederacy however their position as middlemen of the fur trade drastically got reduced the Haudenosaunee would become entangled in wars between the French and the English forcing them to choose sides and causing internal divisions within the confederacy for example after the peace of Montreal the Mohawks who were the closest nation to Montreal they naturally became some of the first communities where French missionaries would go to and became some of the first Haudenosaunee to convert to Christianity this led to divisions and tensions within the Mohawk communities and resulted in new villages being established where Catholic Mohawks could practice Christianity in peace. Over time, more than half of the Mohawk population would end up migrating to these new communities. They were even joined by other nations like the Hurons or the Oneida, the Onondaga. All of these together would eventually become the Seven Nations of Canada and they became allies of the French during the Seven Years' War, whereas the Haudenosaunee Confederacy stayed allies with the English. You had the same people essentially being forced to fight against one another. The American Revolution was also politically divisive for the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The majority chose either neutrality or the British side. So when it was all over, the Haudenosaunee were given land by the British crown as compensation, but this would never fully restore their power. So what are the remnants today of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in Canada? Well, you have remnants of it in Quebec where you have Mohawk communities like Kanawake, Kanasatake, who most of them played a significant role in the Oka crisis, which in itself brought indigenous issues at the forefront of Canada. You have Aquas Sasne Mohawk Territory, which is in the US and Canada. The existence itself of Aquasasne shows the impact of all of these historical wars, even before we became a country, the impact of colonialism ultimately. All these would be technically part of the seven nations of Canada, but if you look at the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and what are the descendants of, of these today in Canada, you have the Tyndanaga Mohawk Nation. And finally, you have Six Nations, the largest reserve in Canada, and the only one that has all six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And when you look at the history of that reserve, in particular Six Nations, you learn a lot about Canadian politics and Canadian history overall. So Six Nations was a result of the American Revolution where the Haudenosaunee Confederacy actually relocated to this territory. Joseph Brandt, who is a Mohawk leader, he was able to secure a tract of land for what was left of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This would become known as the Haldeman Proclamation or the Haldeman Land Tract. And over the course of the next century, the size of the territory would gradually shrink up until 1847 where it was only 5% of the original territory that was actually occupied by the Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee. And that 5% today is what represents the current territory of Six Nations. So Six Nations are actually at the forefront of a legal battle right now over the same Haldeman tract. The Six Nations are suing the federal government, arguing that much of this land was unlawfully taken from them and they're seeking compensation and ultimately the recognition of their, of their treaty rights. When you also consider the fact that all of these communities are located in between Montreal, Toronto, one of the most industrialized parts of the whole country, it's astounding to think of all of the changes that they've seen occur around them, whether it's their political status, their environment, so much has changed over the past 150, 200 years. You add on to that too, the impact of the Indian Act of residential school and all of that historical baggage that comes with it too. It highlights really the ongoing struggle between indigenous people and Canada and the different perspectives that many people have on, on these kinds of issues. But whether we like it or not, they're at the forefront and we have to tackle them them one way or another. You know, it's crazy because they precede the existence of the country itself. But I digress. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, they played a monumental role in North American history 
and they had a huge impact on Canadian history. And the best part is they're still around. You can learn more about Haudenosaunee culture, Haudenosaunee history. Go and visit reserve websites. Go and visit the reserves themselves. And I guarantee you, you're going to learn something about Canada, about Indigenous history, and about Indigenous Canadian culture. So I hope you enjoyed the video and that you learned something new today. Like, subscribe for more content like this, and follow me on my other platforms. I'd appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much, and I'll see you at the next one.